Hello right bags, it's Jade with a beginner's guide to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. This is pretty much just going to deeper explain some of the loot systems, some combat, how to upgrade, some of the map stuff that you need to know about how the changes have gone from Odyssey to this one and try and do it without spoiling too much of the story so you can still enjoy it. I hate doing guides that really teach you exactly what the story does so I've kind of left big chunks out that are pretty obvious especially if you have played them but I've also tried to remember that some of you guys might not have tried it like me. I haven't really played an Assassin's Creed game in a long time but I have spent nearly a week with this game now and I've been enjoying it massively. So so hope you enjoy it. If you do, let me know by liking the video. Leave me a comment about some of your top tips for the beginning stages. I'm going to go over why it's important not to leave Norway too soon and some of the stuff that you can expect once you get to England and just various things to look out for. Do leave me a like. Go and check out all my other guides that are much more distinct about getting special loot and weapons and stuff. And let's go. So you do start out in Norway. Once you've done a few first cutscenes, you're going to be here. You race through the story sections. You could probably get through this area in about, I would say, two and a half, maybe three hours. Or you could spend up to ten hours like me. I would say it's reasonable that when you get to level maybe 15, 16, that's when you want to be thinking about completing the last mission and going over to England. The first part of England that you land in, Leicestershire, will be level 20, but by the time you've gone through the cutscenes, you'll easily gain two or three levels by doing just the very basics of when you get to your settlement. And that's a big part of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, is building up your settlement, grinding out resources, and doing raids so that you can get more resources to build even more of your settlement. Now, none of them features are in the initial stages in Norway. You're not going to be tasked with building anything like that. It's just about going through some of the world events, taking a look at all the wealth and trying to get artifacts, as well as usual hunting and getting around with a little bit of combat. There's three big takeaways you need to have before you leave Norway. One, go and collect all the abilities. Just like previous Assassin's Creed games, you've got special abilities that are mapped out to the left and right bumper, and these vary in ranged or melee. There are specific locations. You do not earn these in just some random way anymore. You will find certain abilities in certain spots all over the game world. The only caveat to this is that when you start unlocking some of your skill points, you will find that some of the skills that you can unlock will be coined or will be termed abilities. And so they won't be actually on the left or the right bumpers. They will just automatically be applied when you do a combination of buttons. There are four that you can find in the Norway region, three in the starting zone and one towards the very end when you go to Arakstead, you'll find another one. Make sure you pick these up before you go, you might as well so you can test some of them out. There's two levels for each one of these abilities. At level one for my Diver of Valkyries, I can launch myself into the air and come crashing down on my enemies. In Marked for Death, I can hold R2 to mark sighted enemies, release to let fly a deadly volley of arrows. But when I upgrade it for level 2 by finding another book with the mark of death, I can actually increase how many people I take aim with this special ability. Now your abilities do obviously have a cooldown on them. To replenish that cooldown, you're going to need to make sure you've got plenty of adrenaline. It's the gold yellow bar just above the big white one on the bottom left. Holding LT or RT will activate either your ranged abilities or your melee abilities. Once you've released it, you can see now you've got to fill it up. There's plenty of skills and plenty of weapons that give you bonuses for your adrenaline refilling, depending on how you hit with either light or heavy attacks. Likewise, doing finishes with heavy attacks will often generate more adrenaline. You can also find mushrooms scattered around England that will increase your adrenaline. Now let's go over one of the biggest changes from Assassin's Creed Odyssey to Valhalla. There is no more randomised loot and so the next important thing is also to know where weapons are. You can go ahead and buy weapons from traders later on in the game and you will come across quite a few but nowhere near as many as the previous game Odyssey. They want you to upgrade your weapons and really take care of stuff and bring it with you so you don't feel like you're always having to get rid of a particular good weapon that you find. This means they are always in the same location which is great for me which means I can do proper guides goes for the armor sets however when you get to England you'll find that you'll find like a headpiece or a chest piece and you'll be wondering where the rest of it is if you actually look in the inscription of that armor piece it will tell you what area of the country it's in where you can get the set bonuses for all of the armor sets too there are five unique weapons that you can find in Norway so you may want to pick these up before progressing but you will find a multitude of these weapons when you hit England too 
One to look out for sure for me was the Iron Star, as I find this a pretty OP beast. But you've also got access to a spear, a hammer, dagger, and a two-handed axe. Right now you should be seeing a link in the top right corner and in the comment section showing you exactly where the locations are of all of them weapons I just mentioned. So when it comes to weapons, you should know by now that yes, you're gonna be upgrading them and taking them with you. That doesn't mean there isn't a big choice. Once you get to England, you'll be able to buy certain weapons like two-handed swords and others. And you'll also be able to find a lot more special legendary weapons too. But they've changed how it went from Odyssey, no longer filling you with just absolutely minuscule items that were pretty much the same. They want you to upgrade and take your favorite weapons along the ride. So you start out with fine items, weapons and armors, and then you can upgrade them to superior. After the superior, you can then go and upgrade them to flawless. Then from flawless, it's gonna be to the mythological. Here you can see I'm doing it with a two-handed sword. I've now made it superior. Now you need a blacksmith to do this and you need certain resources. In the beginning, it's gonna be carbon ingots to make things from fine to superior. And then from superior to flawless, you're gonna need nickel ingots. And then after that, to make flawless until mythological, you're gonna need tungsten ingots. In Norway at the start, you'll only ever find carbon ingots. You won't find the other two, and that'll be placed much in the later stages of the game in the higher regions. Look for medium to large gold circles, and that's where you'll find it in there. You can also, though, buy a map from the cartographer for 30 silver, and it'll give you the location of all of the ingots themselves. When you upgrade with the blacksmith, it's going to give you more slots for runes, and it's going to increase how much you can invest more stat boosting. So you can also upgrade your weapons and armors by spending leather and iron in the beginning stages and you can increase their attack damage, their defense and how it does against various heavy and light damage. You don't need a station or blacksmith to do this, you can do this yourself and you can see I'm increasing it there up to four times. With each increase that the blacksmith does, that should increase how much you can invest in it again. And as I said, rune slots also will increase. So when you do something to superior, you'll get one rune slot. Flawless, you'll get two. And then likewise, likewise, it increases. Each armor and weapon has obviously got its own special perk. Like some might do more heavy damage, or they may allow you to do more attack damage after a heavy finisher. There's various different ones, and that's guess why it's going to be useful going through all these weapons with guides. To upgrade or put more stats into your weapons and armors though, eventually you're going to need more than just iron and leather. If you want to get to the mythological stage, you're going to need much more resources like titanium. You can of course now dual wield. You can put a weapon in your weaker left hand and have your right hand as your main. With the right bumper, obviously you'll do fast attacks and the R2 or RT bumper, you'll be doing heavier. Even without a shield equipped in your aft hand or your left hand, you can still go ahead and defend just by tapping the LB or L1 button. Hold it a little bit longer and you will start doing a special little variation attack. Of course, this does use stamina up and when your stamina is spent, you may find it hard dodging and getting out of the way of enemies. The bar's there on the left hand side and of course next to it, you've got your health, which is no longer going to regenerate. Now one of the first things you need to upgrade is your rations. I highly recommend this. Otherwise pretty much you only really got maybe two portions of health for you to really manage and eat. So it's really important that you upgrade your pouch because obviously it's gonna heal you and the more food you can carry, the more chance you'll be able to heal whenever you need to. You can upgrade it three times before you're gonna need cloth for the next upgrade. Likewise, increase your arrows any chance you get too. You'll be able to increase this four times before you also need cloth. At four, you'll be able to hold up to 18 arrows. And each bow that there is, the recurve and the hunter bow in the beginning stages, use different arrows. Early stages of the game, you'll find that you've got your hunter bow, but you can go ahead and swap it out eventually for a recurve. You'll find one of these in the guide that I've already done. Otherwise, when you get to England, you'll be able to buy the needler pretty easily from one of the settlements. The big difference is that the needler is first person. So when you're firing, you've got much more controlled aim and you can really fire for exactly where you want. Particularly for the marked for death special ability, I do find that it's still much better to have the hunter bow for more combat options. But if you're doing a super stealthy run, then you may want to think about the recurve bow. 
combat itself relies on obviously light attacks building up so that you get some adrenaline then you can use your special abilities or you can finish off enemies with your heavy attack you'll then have lots of bonuses attributed to either your runes or your armor or your weapons that can do various amounts of more damage obviously skill building is going to be something pretty interesting building a complete character that's going to be relying on just stealth or just bows or just melee and with specific weapons i think that's going to be pretty fun learning when to dodge and when to parry is really important it's pretty basic i don't really want to repeat exactly what you should kind of know from playing these games but yes parrying at the right time means you'll be able to get in with a good counter attack now when it's flashing red you can't obviously parry it you're gonna to have to move around and i found that actually dodging around enemies was much better than trying to always parry it I'm definitely going to do a ranking in terms of abilities as well, which ones I really like and which ones I don't think are worth your time. But now let's move on to runes. Now with the runes you can chop and change whenever you want. And then these are broken down into minor and major. Obviously the minor are only going to give you small buffs, the major will give you much larger. I won't necessarily go through them all, I'm sure you'll be able to read it once you get going. But there are things like helping give you two extra damage with assassination. You can get Rune of Tactics, which gives you 5% extra ability damage. There's many, many versions that all do different things, like I said, either helping you with attack or defense. You can slot any of your weapon runes into any of your weapons at any time, and there's no penalty if you decide you want to remove one and put it somewhere else. You can also sell these if you do find that you're coming across too many that are similar. Generally, you'll find these at random chances alongside picking up other loot. They're not necessarily marked on the map, but whenever you go looting around, or specifically dead bodies, I find I always get a few of these off maybe higher level enemies. And although you might be itching to get to England, I would suggest you do stick around and try and complete as many of the world events in Norway as possible. These are relatively easy. You don't have as many distractions. The game world in Norway is pretty sparse. There's not as much wildlife. There's not as many enemy settlements or patrols. And so it's quite easy to go around and level yourself up. I myself got to levels like 27. And by the time I'd done through the cutscenes, I was easily over level 30 by the time I stepped into England. As always with these games, there's a variety of different mini games that you can take part in, including flighting, you've seen it, the rap battles probably. You can win silver by winning them, but also you'll get charisma points by completing them, and that's important for having some dialogue options with NPCs later. Brawling as well, you can have unarmed combat, and this is how you can get brand new recruits for the big mechanic of the game, which is of course the raiding. There will be certain story beats and choices that will affect who joins your clan, who joins your settlement and who doesn't. Now a lot of these decisions won't affect the actual game, however there are some that will affect the ending. You can look that up or maybe I'll even do a guide if you really want to know which of decisions affect the ending. Last thing I would say as well in the starting area is taking part in the mini games is pretty productive in terms of getting silver. I again had quite a bit of silver by the time I went to England and I rinsed out some of these mini games. Whether it's having a drinking competition, whether it's Orlog, the brand new dice game, or like I said, some of them other events, they're worth doing just to get lots of silver. You will get silver from getting raids and kills and stuff. So I'm sure you've seen enough now about the raiding mechanic, but pretty much you can take your boat or you can call your boat anywhere you're near water and it will come along with your crew. In all honesty, they're a bit useless. You can do the more traditional route of being an assassin, climbing over walls and going through, but the very early stages, the game kind of makes you take your crew and they kind of just get in the way. For the most part though, you can kind of leave them to it. They'll keep some of the guards happy or busy while you go and try and find the kill or you're raiding some of the loot inside a settlement. You'll get like a mini practice run in Norway, but until you get to England is where the action really is. You'll see lots of red crosses and this signifies a place that you can raid. But don't go off too mad trying to raid everywhere. A lot of these places will be part of the story, so it might be worth considering doing a few bits of the story first and see if they float in nearby or it is going to be part of that. So you don't have to do the same thing twice or kind of ruin it for yourself and get there and find that you've already killed all the enemies. The whole point of raiding when it's not tied to a mission specific is to get resources. Specifically, you're going to need supplies and you're definitely going to need a lot of that if you want to build up your own settlement. Your own settlement costs a huge amount of resources to build certain huts, like adding a proper trading station or tattoo parlor or building the seer hut. So you're going to need to do a lot of raiding to get these supplies. You will find some of the supplies out in the open occasionally in certain little villages or towns and if you loot certain chests 
you will start to get them, but only when you get arrive in, in England. Sent me very light spoiler. At some point when you're about to leave Norway, you've got the option to take some supplies and raw materials with you or leave them with the people that are still there. Go ahead and take them, I would say. However, there are some decisions that if you get too many wrong, your brother won't stay with you in England. He may go back to Norway. So you may want to really adjust or look it up. Maybe I will do that guide and show you guys exactly what choices will result in that so you don't have to worry. But yeah, I would say take resources with you as it will give you an extra little boost to build up your settlement once you arrive. I'll leave it there for now. Remember, this is a beginner's guide. By the time you've got through all the content to get to that stage, you'll be at least four or five hours into the game maybe even more now to get around the map you can do the usual fast travel between the eagle points however there's a new one as well where you've got the docks now docks can be a bit finicky there's plenty of villages and towns i really felt like there should be a waypoint for them so you may want to make sure you go all the way around a town, particularly when it's so close to water, just to see if it has got a fast travel point. You'll obviously be getting around mostly by your horse or by your boat, but you can also steal little rowboats too, just to, on your own. So when you look at the map, you've got your wealth, you've got your mysteries or world events, and then you've got your artifacts. Now the wealth is obviously the gold little dots. The smaller the gold dot, the chance are it's just going to be metal and leather. So if you've got plenty of that, you maybe don't want to hassle around too much, or it's going to have some maybe small amounts of silver. The medium and larger gold circles, they're going to be armor. They're going to be ability books. That's going to be some good loot. So it's definitely worth checking out the larger ones. If you synchronize an area, it still doesn't reveal every single destination and exactly what's there. It's only when you get really close to them does it start showing you exactly what is there. Instead, synchronizing will just generally show what is in the area, at least in terms of either small loot or larger loot. The blue dots are the world events and how you're going to get your XP. And it's really important, as I said, to do as much of that before you leave Norway. As you can see, there's a bunch of them here, though. Again, same sort of principle, but there's no sort of minor or larger. These are a real mixture of conversations with NPCs, little funny quests. Sometimes there'll be bandit trouble. Other times there'll be like cairnstones or little mini puzzles. And each one or subset of these has got their own little indicator. So when you get close to it, it does reveal exactly what type it is. So if you don't want to take part in it, you can just go about your business. Some of these, when you complete all of them though, will lead to extra bounties and the idea that you can get some extra loot when you've gone through certain regions. The final real big one is the artifacts. Now the artifacts pretty much either give you tattoos, they'll be chasing the papers, sometimes there'll be treasure maps that reveal a location of a little hoard nearby, and these are marked out by a white little dot. Pretty basic, but each area region will have a power cap level, so you shouldn't really be in there until you're close to that level, otherwise enemies are going to be way too tough, and generally you've got to help the leader of each region. If you take a look in your bag, you'll see all the runes that you've collected so far and a lot of collectibles. These will generally be keys to open up mission areas when you're doing raids, etc. However, some of these will be decorations for your settlement, but we'll get to that in a while. You'll also come across trade goods. It's worth keeping hold of these until you unlock the trader in your settlement. You can go ahead and sell these at any just random trader, but I do believe there is a benefit to doing it with yours when you get to your settlement. Or an iron is something you're going to need absolute bucket loads of if you really want to keep upgrading your weapons. So never pass up the opportunity to grab some iron. Likewise, hunting is a good source to get leather. Otherwise, you can go ahead and just buy it fairly cheap from any trader. Apart from buying maybe one or two odd weapons that I hadn't already found, I didn't have too much use for my silver, so I'm always going around and making sure I'm topping up my leather and iron resources. Eventually, you'll get to the stage where your upgrades will require a few more expensive items like fabric, and titanium you won't find any titanium in norway nor fabric that comes when you hit england so now we move on to skills which will maybe not look too dissimilar from what you've seen in odyssey obviously with the skyrim-esque background so there's three kind of distinct paths you've got the raven which is the stealth the bear skills which is going to be melee and wolf which is going to be ranged but then you do have crossovers when you unlock some more of these nodes they'll open up little extra branches and at the heart of each one of these little extra disciplines you'll find a special move that you can activate with a button press or almost like a skill so they will give you various different things like you'll be able to take a shot at an enemy before he turns red if he spots you or something like dodging just before an attack is going to grant you heightened senses, making others around you appear to move slower for a time. 
Some of these kind of additional skills are going to take quite a lot of experience points to work towards, hence why it's better off you that you do as many of the side missions as possible and the main quests. And around all of these nodes, you'll generally have the same sort of thing. Each one will give you the ability to increase some melee, some stealth, some damage with your general weapons, as well as bows. Some of them will have a little bit more specialised towards others and obviously going down a tree of the bear or the wolf or the crow and that should kind of lean towards a little bit more. Specifically you'll find a specialist one that gives a buff to pretty much everything in that tree. So it'll be the way of the raven and these will give you like a one extra attack, three extra stun, two extra block, one extra armour etc. Don't forget to pay attention to your armour and what kind of version it is. Is it wolf armour? Is it raven? Because that will also benefit your skills and they'll complement each other if you're aligned. And don't forget you can reset your skills at any point and just respec yourself. So one situation you need more range, go for it. One situation more melee, you can do that. All throughout Norway and early stages of England, every pretty much mission is going to give you at least two skill points and most of the world events will give you two skill points when they give you enough XP. Obviously as you get higher that XP is going to get larger so you're going to have to work more for each skill point. Finishing off with just a couple of options that you need to know about. You can go into the gameplay options and you can adjust and change exactly how much help you're given. So if you do want more of a classic experience, consider turning some of these on or off. One of the options allows you to turn on instant kill with assassinations. So pretty much like the old school way of playing it, even against much higher level enemies. And lastly, just a little bit about the ancient order and pretty much what you can be doing as a side quest line. This opens up a pretty significant part of the game where you'll have to go through the mission steps as well as take on some extra missions and you'll come across various different enemies that you'll have to kill to gain knowledge before taking on some of the more harder ones. Eventually, when you get around to it, you'll be going after the masterminds before finally taking on the head honcho. Once you've killed maybe five or six of these dudes, it will open up that explorable area. I won't spoil too much, but yeah, it just adds another area for you to go and explore and another side step of the missions to go and try out. Four of them are part of the storyline and the other two you will find just on the map marked with a location. You may have seen some mythological places as well in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. You won't unlock visiting some of them places like Jotheim as well as Asgard until you complete the Valka missions. So pretty much when you get to your settlement you'll need to build her a hut and then take care of all her missions before you can explore some of the mythological realms. So there you go, that's pretty much the basics of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Hopefully it's helped you and do look out for more detailed guides now. This was really just get you in the mood for when you're hopefully downloading the game. I'll see you at Bags for even more. Go and check out, like I said, all the guides, all the links for them will be in the comment section. I'll see you at Bags later.